Hello! Welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Timothy Revel in New York. And I'm Christy Taylor in a slightly different location in New York. Welcome to the show. This week, we learn about a test that could let you know if you're at risk of developing Alzheimer's before you even have any symptoms. And why researchers are investigating whether injecting carbon dioxide underground could cause earthquakes. Plus not one, but two stories from outer space. How NASA lost the famed Voyager 2 probe, and the first round of images from a telescope sent to hunt dark matter and energy. Also, because our eyes are too big for this little podcast, we've also got a lightning round of some tantalizing other tidbits from the world of science and technology. But first up, the latest on what has been seven days of nonstop superconductor drama. On the last show, we spoke about LK99, a new material that its creators say is a room temperature and ambient pressure superconductor. That means it can perfectly conduct electricity, which would be just an amazing discovery across science and technology. So, of course, many researchers have been skeptical of the claims, and many have now been investigating the material for themselves. There's been a flurry of attempts by other labs to both replicate the findings and then run simulations to see if and how LK99 is actually a superconductor. Here to help us make sense of it is our physics reporter, Carmela Padovich Callahan. So it's been quite a week for you, huh? It's been like nothing I've ever reported on. People are usually extremely bored by condensed matter physics. And here we've had this amazing hum of activity around this one very preliminary work. It all started when researchers shared two preprint papers, so sort of drafts of papers that haven't been peer-reviewed yet, but they outlined how to make LK99 and some sort of measurements that imply that it's a superconductor room temperature and ambient pressure. Since then, other labs have been scrutinizing the work and trying to build the materials for themselves. And amazingly, not just labs, as is very unusual for this kind of material science, there's been quite a few citizen scientists who've been trying to make the materials by themselves. And, and quite remarkably, you can follow people sort of live streaming what they're doing in their garages and kitchens on, on social media. Yeah, I've, I've been following along with you and just the intense interest around this has been really quite something to behold. And those amateur attempts, I like I can't keep my eyes off them. It's amazing. <laughs> So of of the more traditional labs that are working on it, some of them have now put out their own papers on LK99. Do we now have a bit of a better idea than we did last week on if it's actually a superconductor? Right. So so as of today, there's been two independent research groups, one in India and then one in China, who shared papers describing their work with LK99. So they, they made it according to the steps in the original papers, and they ran some preliminary tests for superconductivity. In either case, they found basically no superconductivity at all. And then recently, and by recently, I mean like 12 hours ago, (laughs) there was one more paper from another team in China, so a a completely separate group, where they did a measurement that indicates that LK99 maybe does superconduct, but not at room temperature, rather at about minus 163 Celsius. For American audience, that's minus 261 Fahrenheit, which is actually not even that high compared to materials that we had in the 80s and the 90s. So, so far, we've basically have no definitive evidence that, you know, the room temperature, the ambient pressure, the things you really want, if this thing was ever going to be practical, have been confirmed by an independent replication. Yeah, I know uh, Hyun Tak Kim. He's one of the researchers in the original team. He puts these failed replications down to the other researchers not creating a pure enough sample of LK99 and has also said he's in contact with them about how to do it, though it's unclear if not creating a pure enough sample really is behind these results. I know another avenue that researchers have been looking at beyond the replications are these attempts to understand what could be going on at a molecular level with the material. And maybe that might tell us if it has any special properties. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this point is is well worth making that it does seem like creating this material is is quite difficult. Like the chemistry of it is is part of the mystery. So people have been trying to do simulations and sort of use quantum theory and and you know supercomputers really to figure out 
what exactly could be happening to things like electrons inside of LK99. If you know what the electrons are doing, you can talk about how they will carry electricity around. So if you have like very normal electrons, superconductivity is basically out of the question. But if the electrons have some sort of you know odd property or unusual property, then you can say, well, maybe they can do something as unusual as superconductivity. We've seen quite a few computations so far. They all start with the assumptions that the atoms that make up LK99 are arranged exactly as its creators initially reported. And they, all of these simulations that start with that assumption do find some unusual electron properties. So the simulations make a case that superconductivity could be possible. However, this approach is not such that you could sort of simulate superconductivity directly or that you could ask if electron has this property, does it always superconduct? So it's sort of part of the puzzle, but not necessarily smoking gun evidence. I think it's also worth saying that the researcher who published one of these first computation papers announced it with an Obama mic drop gif <laughs> and a link to the paper on Twitter, which like, I found that pretty amusing. It just shows like the <laughs> frenzy that's around this at the moment. Yeah. And immediately, like chemist uh, figured out how to use Twitter to tell you that x-ray diffraction analysis that like tells you where the atoms are that she used wasn't actually that good. So you've got Obama mic drops, you've got Twitter beefs, you've got chemists tweeting like they've never tweeted before. It's really, <laughs> really quite something else. What should we be thinking about this material? Where does it leave us as we as we watch the frenzy sort of continue? I mean, I think it's really important to keep reminding folks that the stakes here really are high. So a room temperature and ambient pressure superconductor could be very transformative. We could use them for everything from MRIs to even, you know, some people say it would help make more compact, commercially viable nuclear fusion. And it would be such a huge breakthrough in condensed matter physics. Like we've been looking for this for 50, 60 years. And even the theory sort of stuck as to how you would get to high temperatures and ambient pressures. So this is part of the excitement, but also part of why it's so hard to say anything definitive, because if we get this wrong, it's a huge mistake. And my, my take right now is that we're still very much in the skepticism phase. You know, the theoretical evidence is not opposing the idea of unusual superconductivity. And there are rumors that more experimental replications have been done or are underway. So we just need more experiments, more results, more thorough data to convince the world that we've had this breakthrough, to convince me that we've had this breakthrough, if I'm being very honest, I'm, I'm going to need to see more than one measurement. There's a sort of a whole slew of things a superconductor should be able to do to convince you it's a superconductor. And I'm eagerly awaiting to see that. We are off next to the Cascadia Basin off Canada's west coast, where a group of researchers have a plan to inject millions of tons of carbon into the seafloor. This is a trial for getting it out of the atmosphere and helping slow climate change. And new research has concluded that the thing you definitely don't need to worry about is earthquakes, even though some folks have absolutely been worried about earthquakes. James Deneen is here. What's going on? Yes, hello. Well, you might have heard talk about this thing called carbon capture and storage, which is the notion of capturing CO2 from some source of emissions or removing it directly from the atmosphere and then storing it somewhere safe for hundreds or thousands of years. Carbon capture and storage is controversial, but it's likely to play at least some role in combating climate change. And one idea is to store the CO2 in basalt rock, where over years, the CO2 reacts with the basalt to form into solid calcium carbonate. But there aren't many places on land where this suitable basalt is available. So this group of researchers in Canada have a project called Solid Carbon, where they have proposed to inject millions of tons of CO2 in the young basalt rock beneath the seafloor about 200 kilometers or 120 miles off the west coast of Vancouver Island in what's called the Cascadia Basin. And the potential there is really big. They've, they've done a lot of research on the area and found that if they used all the basalt across the entire basin, they could store something like 750 billion tons of CO2. And it would take less than 135 years to effectively turn to stone. Wow. And we did start out by mentioning earthquakes. 
I hear the word Cascadia personally, and my mind immediately goes to the fact that it's a region with a major earthquake looming, just because of how the tectonic plates are arranged. Does that have anything to do with this project, though? Well, sort of. The So the Cascadia Basin as a whole is a seismically active area, but the site where they want to inject CO2 is very far from the Cascadia Fault that would cause that so-called big one. So there's no connection there. But there are smaller faults all over the place. And one concern about geological carbon storage projects like this one in general is that injecting large amounts of CO2 underground could cause a fault to slip and trigger an earthquake, which you know, might be hazardous to people, or it also could let the CO2 leak back out into the atmosphere, which would, you know, defeat the whole purpose of putting it underground. This is called induced seismicity, and it's a well-documented phenomenon. You might have you might have heard about it happening with fracking-related projects in the U.S. Midwest, for instance. Yeah, we've also spoken about it quite a lot in a U.K. context with fracking there. But could you just give us a reminder what, what actually is induced seismicity? Yeah, so it just, it means seismic activity caused by people. And what can happen is in in a fault, you have two surfaces that are locked up against each other. And if you increase the pressure between those surfaces, they can unclamp and slip, creating an earthquake. And for that to happen, a number of factors have to be just right, like the orientation of the fault, for instance. But pumping fluid of any kind underground can increase the pressure within a fault, leading to a slip. And so is the worry that this is something that could happen with this carbon capture project in Canada? Well, it doesn't look like it. Okay. The researchers behind the project thought it was important to be proactive, especially given the seismic activity in the Cascadia Basin, and they modeled how the faults around the injection site would respond to any added pressure from CO2 and found there was effectively no risk of triggering an earthquake. And even if there was an earthquake, they pointed out that it would be too small and too far from the coast to have any impact on people. That's, I mean, that sounds like pretty good news. I guess with all those temperature records we've been hearing about this summer, feels like we should take the winds where we can. Yes, but we should point out that elsewhere, people are also talking about large-scale CO2 sequestration. And other researchers I spoke with said earthquakes could become a bigger concern as more and more of those projects start to get underway, especially if they're on land near to people. So it's important for geological carbon storage projects to carefully choose their sites and to monitor what happens even after the carbon is back in the ground. Time for an update on all the other great things in the New Scientist feed. Dead Planet Society is still out there breaking stuff, so if you didn't already catch it this week, it's all about the surprising difficulty of punching a hole in a planet. I guess you could wear it as a necklace then? I don't even know. Uh, (laughs) But we've also got coming next week a really delightful interview with the archaeologist, TV presenter, and now children's book author Alice Roberts. Um, She does a lot of work communicating science to curious young minds, and we're going to hear all about it. And New Scientist also recently partnered up on an event with Envision Racing, and they're people who make Formula E racing cars. And as part of it, Aidan Gallagher, the Umbrella Academy actor and also climate activist, told the audience how he tries to turn climate anxiety into something useful. It's hard in that state of anxiety to flip it and use it to really drive you, because I just, for me personally, I... I see it in my head as this massive, this is what I'm having climate anxiety. I see it as this massive tidal wave. It's this ginormous problem and I'm this small thing. What can I do to overcome that? I've been able to get past that yeah. personally by seeing people who are much smarter than me and on the front lines of fighting the variety of crises in a different ways. So. If I look to the right places, I am find that I could be filled with optimism just as much as you could sort of scare yourself away. So uh, social media is an incredibly powerful tool. I very much am in this in terms of luck. I've been someone who encountered what's going on and then, oh my gosh, I have people who happen to see the things that I put out. So I do feel responsible in a way to help share whatever I come across that I feel is important. Greta puts it really well in this metaphor of a burning house and I look at it that way a lot of like if the house is on fire and there are people who are unaware of it they're sleeping you'd want to wake them up and you know communally we there's no other house to go to so we got to put out the fire. You can find an interview with Aiden on our website at newscientist.com.
All right, on today's voyages, we are going to space next, where NASA lost contact with my favorite space object of all time, Voyager 2. Space reporter Leia Crane is here. Leia, can you give us a quick reminder of what Voyager 2 is, how cool it is, and what the heck happened? Voyager 2 is very cool. Um, (laughs) It is a spacecraft that NASA sent up 46 years ago. And since then, it's visited all of the outer solar system planets, and now it's just hurtling past the edge of the solar system. Unfortunately, right now, we cannot contact it. There was a signal sent from Mission Control at NASA that was a little bit of an error, and it turned the antenna that usually points right at Earth just two degrees off. But that means that it's not hearing anything we're sending, and we can't hear anything that it's sending. Oh, what a rookie error. (laughs) <laughs> NASA. Yeah, like... After 46 years, you'd think. Um, <laughs> stuff happens. It's only two degrees off. The upside is that then, after about a week, they did hear this carrier signal, which mm-hmm. is the signal that's usually live streaming data back to us. But they only heard basically the very edge of the signal. So we know the spacecraft's doing okay, but mm-hmm. we can't get any data from it. And we can't really, as far as we know, send anything to it. <laughs> That sounds like it's going to be a problem for continuing to do science with Voyager. Is there a way to get back in touch, get that antenna reoriented? Yes. Um, thankfully, <laughs> everything is actually fine and it's not that okay. huge a deal because it has this automatic program on it that a couple times a year just automatically reorients it. So on October 15th, that's the next time that program will run, it'll point itself back at Earth. And uh, folks at NASA are going to keep trying to send it signals before then. But even if those don't work, which they don't really think it will, it's still going to point back at us in October. Okay, well, that's that's a good fail self. I feel like maybe when I called those folks at NASA rookies, that was a little premature. They had a plan for this exact situation. (laughs) Yeah, they're they're good at backups. Yeah, good at backups. So what do the next few years for Voyager 2 look like? Once it's back realigned, what's in its near future? Basically, just continue flying through largely empty space. Um, There's been a lot of arguments about when it officially left the solar system, because the edge of the solar system is a tricky thing to define. But I think everyone kind of agrees now that it's out. So (laughs) what it's doing is it's taking a lot of measurements of interstellar space that help us sort of understand our solar neighborhood, and it's flying away. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you've also got another good news story for us on the sort of objects we've chucked off the planet front <laughs> this week. So the Euclid Space Telescope, that's now come online and it's started sending back its first images. Yes, um, I am a fan of the Euclid Space Telescope. It's a particularly cool one to me because what it's doing is trying to investigate dark matter and dark energy. These first pictures, of course, as they always are, are engineering calibration pictures. It hasn't started doing real science mm. yet, but I'm really excited for what's to come. Yeah. What what has it brought with it? How do you go on a hunt for dark matter and dark energy? So basically, you go on a hunt for those things which we can't see, which is why they're called dark, by looking at the shapes and arrangements of the things we can see, which are largely galaxies. So we know that dark matter really heavily affects the shapes of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So it's looking a lot at that and measuring the distances to things. And because dark energy governs the expansion of the universe, measuring the distances to things and how fast they're moving away from us helps us understand that. So it's really building this huge 3D map of galaxies in order to help us learn about those those major components of the universe that we can't see. This reminds me kind of of like the Event Horizon Telescope, which has sent us back a couple of those really amazing black hole pictures. But I imagine if we're looking at dark matter and dark energy, the kinds of images that might have revealing signatures, like it would be a very different kind of thing. It's not like, you know, here here's a like one blob of light. Yeah, well, you know, you can't, dark matter is invisible and dark energy is, as far <laughs> as we know, energy. So you can't can't really take a picture of either of those. So these pictures are going to look like big galaxy field pictures. If you've seen the Hubble Deep Field or basically any picture of a large field of space, that's what they're going to look like. They're not going to look like, you know, spooky dark matter. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so what kind of time frame are we looking at then before we start to see, you know, big deep field galaxies and then evidence of some kind that or, or shapes and arrangements that give us better clues? How, how soon might that come together? So it's going to be a couple of months before we start seeing data come back at all. The full mission is six years long, although as we've seen with space telescopes, usually they last way longer than the full mission. But this is one of those tasks that really requires a lot of statistics. You have to have a lot of galaxies. So it might take a couple years for us to actually be able to use those images to make any really useful inferences about dark matter and dark energy. Next up, a new blood test for Alzheimer's has gone on sale that may indicate our risk of developing the disease before symptoms show. And that would, of course, be a big deal, especially if we can see where we might be heading with Alzheimer's. But there are concerns that we're moving a little too fast, given that we don't fully know how accurate this test is yet. So to tell us all about it, we have medical reporter Claire Wilson. Hi, Claire. Hello. So this test, it's becoming available for the general public, right? Yes, so previously it was available to doctors, but this week the US firm called Quest Diagnostics has put the test on sale to the public for people who either have possible Alzheimer's symptoms, like forgetfulness, or if you are 65 or older, or even if you are just over 18 and have ever had a blow to the head or a family history of the disease. Oh, interesting. So tell us what does the test actually involve? Okay, the, the test looks for a protein called beta amyloid, or sometimes just amyloid for short. Alzheimer's may be partly caused by the buildup of plaques of amyloid in the brain, and this is thought to contribute to the symptoms of memory loss and confusion. And so is it this beta amyloid that the test measures? Well, it's a test for the level of amyloid in the blood. Now, without getting too bogged down in detail, it actually measures the ratio of one form of amyloid to a slightly different form because a lower ratio has been found to correlate with the amount of amyloid plaques in the brain. And crucially, this, this fall in the ratio seems to happen several years before plaques can be seen in the brain by about six years on average. That sounds like a really incredible possible head start on knowing you're going to get Alzheimer's, which I have both had blows to the head and uh, family history. So I feel kind of personally invested in, in knowing a little bit about this. And, you know, the theory, I guess, is you could then, you know, possibly head off actually getting Alzheimer's with whatever treatments are out there. Well, that's a sticky point. So you might have heard of a couple of new treatments that recently became available in the U.S., Two drugs have been approved for Alzheimer's that consist of antibodies to amyloid. They bind to the plaque and trigger clearance by the immune system. But we, we must point out that while the antibodies do seem to cause a small slowing of a person's rate of mental deterioration, these treatments don't seem to reverse or even halt the disease's progress. They just slightly slow the deterioration. And as to whether a test might be widely adopted to help people start taking treatments, there are some serious downsides, and doctors are actually quite cautious about this test. What kinds of downsides are you talking about? Yeah, well, there are concerns about whether this test has gone on sale just too early, really, for how certain the science is. So this test is also being used by doctors as a diagnostic aid for people who turn up with potential Alzheimer's symptoms, alongside a lot of other investigations. And it's also uh, you know, used by researchers wanting to recruit people into their clinical trials who are more at risk. But this is the first time it has gone on sale to the general public who have no symptoms. And as you pointed out, you know, it's so common to have some of those risk factors. Like who hasn't had a blow to their head at some point? <laughs> um, some doctors are concerned. And we don't know if it's accurate enough to be just used on everybody without symptoms. The manufacturer called Quest doesn't provide that kind of detail on its website about how accurate it is. Yeah, it's not ideal. It feels like that's where you really want some transparency about it. I mean, we've written a lot before about if these amyloid proteins really are responsible for Alzheimer's, and which we don't really know that for sure, and certainly we, our understanding of it is far from complete. And then we've also covered, as you mentioned, that many of these treatments are at best a little lackluster at the moment. So where does this test really come in? It seems like if you, even if you got a positive result, it's quite hard to know what use that would be. Is there anything you can do to, if you know that maybe you're at higher risk of Alzheimer's to try and prevent it in the future? We've 
put your finger on it. That is the whole problem. So even assuming if it is accurate, it leaves you with the problem of what on earth do you do with a positive result? There are no drugs currently approved for treating people who have a positive result but don't have symptoms. The company recommends on its website that people you know, adopt healthier lifestyles to try to reduce their risk of the disease. For instance, try and exercise more. But the best estimates for how much those kind of lifestyle factors affect your, your risk of disease is they don't have that big an effect. And you know, it's probably due more to things like genetic factors. So I think it would be a huge psychological blow to get a positive result from this test. Yeah, I, I think that's how I feel about it, really. But I guess some people, they would rather know what their future might hold. And I guess they have a right to it, too. No one's really forcing them to take the test. No, but as long as they are forewarned about all the potential downsides, there's also the problem that in the US, having a positive result from a test like this could make it harder to get healthcare insurance. And even a prospective employer could be entitled to learn this information when if they make it just a request to see your healthcare records, because it could get mixed up in your healthcare records. It is something of a grey area, but it, it can't be ruled out that it could have those effects. And you know, as the test is available for people who are just 18 and over, it could potentially have these, these downsides on someone for many, many decades of their life. All right, Tim, what have we missed this week? So many things. So one particularly cool story this week that I was really excited about was about how the foundations of a house could be used to store a day's worth of energy. And that just sounded pretty incredible to me. The idea effectively would be to make concrete slabs that are supercapacitors, not to be confused with superconductors. And these are <laughs> a, a kind of battery alternative. All right. So how do you actually go ahead and do that, though? Yeah. So the trick is you mix cement with this very fine charcoal, which is called carbon black. And those two materials, cement and carbon black, they've been around for thousands of years. And it turns out when you put them in just the right configuration, they can be used to make a giant supercapacitor. And the team behind the work, well, they calculated that a block of this material that's about 3.5 meters or 11.5 feet on each side, it could hold about 10 kilowatt hours of energy. And that would be about the same as an average U.S. household's daily usage. You know, it's so cool when very simple materials can be used in a really sophisticated way. This seems like one day you might even be able to connect this kind of storage device to solar panels on your roof or something like that. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what they've got in mind, though no details yet on if a prototype house is going to be built anytime soon has actually come forward. All right. Speaking of sophisticated outcomes from simple materials, Tim, do you know what the Maillard reaction is? Yes, of course. That's that delicious chemical reaction that normally requires heat. And it's the one that makes toast so tasty. It's also responsible for that delicious flavor you get when mushrooms are seared or steaks for those who dabble. Exactly. So what if I told you it was also happening in the ocean floor, like at fairly cold temperatures and maybe helping lock millions of tons of carbon away per year? I'd be pretty shocked. Normally, water and cold temperatures is not how you get this reaction. Yeah, and you'd get soggy mushrooms while you're there. So <laughs> there's new research out that has found that this could be happening. Uh, the Maillard reaction doesn't actually require searing hot stovetop temperatures. It's, in fact, been observed to happen at the cold conditions, 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that we also see on the seafloor. So to find this out, a research team in a lab, they mixed sugars and amino acids, which is what you need to do this reaction, and which you also see in debris from dead plants and animals drifting down through the ocean. They also used manganese and iron, which are minerals that are abundant on the seafloor, to catalyze the reaction so it ran about twice as fast. And voila, even when incubating the solution at that cold ocean water temperature, they observed Maillard magic. That's pretty cool. I mean, is this just one of those fun quirks or does it tell us something about life in the depths of the ocean? Well, it might actually tell us about life in the depths of the ocean. For example, the byproducts of this reaction are the very same complex carbon molecules that we see storing carbon on the ocean floor. So it could be a really key part of how the oceans take carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, life drifts down. It stays there. 
and that carbon is then stored for the long term. So the research team modeled this. Uh, they estimated that the Maillard reaction could actually be responsible for helping the seafloor store as many as 4 million tons, and that's million tons, of atmospheric <laughs> carbon per year, which could then have maybe buffered us from up to 5 degrees Celsius of global warming over the last 400 million years. It's a lot of numbers, but basically... This is a huge cycle of carbon, and the Maillard reaction may be part of what's driving it. Amazing. Yeah, imagine being responsible for both toast and <laughs> saving us from five extra degrees of global warming. That's amazing. What a reaction. So now I'm just wondering if the seabed also has that delicious Maillardy smell. <laughs> um, well, you could be the first to go find out if you want. <laughs> so, Tim, what do we got for our last story? Okay, so one final little story. We're going to stay in the ocean where researchers have unearthed a fossil of a jellyfish preserved from around 500 million years ago. And it's the oldest jellyfish fossil we've ever found. I love jellyfish. Where was it? Who was it? Why was it? Was it pretty? Tell me all the details. <laughs> Well, so actually, it looks quite a lot like a modern jellyfish. It's got a big bell-shaped body and dozens of tentacles. And it was found in the Burgess Shale, which is that very rich fossil deposit in the Canadian Rocky Mountains, where animals have been found with incredible levels of preservation, even down to their soft tissues. And so there's stomachs, eyes, you name it, it's got it. <laughs> well, this sounds very good, given that a jellyfish is basically entirely soft tissue, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Jellyfish, they are mostly jelly. Or is that what you guys call jello? Yes, I'm going to go rename them all jello fish now. <laughs> yeah, so this particular jello fish. Oh. <laughs> I was like, don't say jello fish. Don't write it in. It's one joke too many. And then my brain was like, do jello fish. <laughs> this particular jellyfish, it's been named uh, Burgesso medusa phasmiformis which means the Burgess Shale jellyfish with a ghost-like form. That's because the researchers who found it say it looked a bit like a Pac-Man ghost. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. As always, our show notes have links to all the fantastic new scientist reporting you heard about today. Check them out for all the details we did not have time to yammer on about. You can subscribe to our show on whatever app you're listening on. And if you want to give us a bit of extra support, which we would really appreciate, please give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really helps the algorithms help us. Thank you and bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. 